Welcome to this episode of the Wagging Tail Podcast. In this episode, we are talking about handling aggression in dogs. This is a really important topic to a lot of people. Understanding and managing aggression can be a huge, huge factor for a lot of dog owners. One thing that many people don't understand is that you only see a very small percentage of dogs that people actually have as pets. So you'll see the percentage of dogs that can go out and do anything. They're the dogs that go to cafes, they're the dogs that go to the bars, to the park, to the beach, all of that good stuff. There is a big percentage of dog owners, of dog guardians, that have dogs with reactivity, with anxiety, and other elements which create aggressive behavior. And this is really tough for a lot of people. And honestly, it's one of these things that a lot of people struggle with very quietly. And it can be quite a, quite a lonely and stressful thing to, to really struggle with, to have in your life. So it is incredibly important to understand this topic. Jay, you still there? Yep, yep. Yep. All right. So I'm going to go briefly talk about what we're going to be talking about in this uh, this episode. So aggression is, like, like Fraser said, it's something that not everybody comes across. Um, thankfully, of course, there's, there seems to be less and less serious cases of uh, aggression that we've noticed over the past few years. So the, the first thing for everyone to understand about aggression is that why do dogs show aggression? So there can be a number of reasons, but majority of aggression issues stem from fear. So that's why we call it fear-based aggression. It's not actually a dog trying to dominate anybody. It's just because the dog has so much fear that due to things like trauma in the past, they could have a lack of proper socialization when they were young, they didn't have enough socialization, or they do not have what we call enough um, optimism. They don't, they don't really like new or unfamiliar situations. It's very similar to how we are as well. So if you've had a lot of trauma in the past, you, you never really got out and socialized or you, you're, you're just very uncomfortable with new and familiar situations. It is all part of fear and fear can result in aggression. There's also things like territorial behavior. Um, the, Dogs who are not comfortable in their own home or do not feel like their handlers are are capable of of giving them all the safety and comfort they need, they could perceive things that come into their territory as a threat, whether it's their home, the yard, or I would believe, Fraser, correct me if I'm wrong, like territorial behavior can be put on a person as well. Mm -hmm. Am I right to say that? Yeah, that's what, that's what we call uh, possessive behaviour, but it's the same sort of idea that this area is something that they need to protect. Yes. So it's, it's actually a very good point. We'll, we'll go into a lot more detail on these uh, these types of aggression in a little bit. Um, the overview of what we're going to be looking at during this topic is going to be the why, what Jay was just talking about there. Um, yep what aggression actually looks like, when to intervene, and what to do when the aggressive situations are happening, as well as touching on the long-term strategies. So guys, please stay, stay tuned for these practical tips and, and the insights into aggression, because it can be quite eye-opening to a lot of people that, that thought that they knew what it was for a um, for dog to be aggressive. So. First of all, why do dogs show aggression? Well, Jay touched on some really good points there. Um, aggression is a symptom of an underlying issue, such as fear when dogs feel threatened or for unfamiliar people or animals or environments and things like that. It could be general anxiety or specific anxieties that come from triggers and triggering situations. And it can also be frustration and even anger a dog's inability to access something or get what they want, which a lot of humans can uh, can attest to 
not just for dogs, but also themselves, I'm very sure. But there's influences on this aggressive behavior. Um, now, you've got to be careful about some of this, but it is very important to address is that uh, genetics do play a big part of this. Some, some breeds may have genetic pre predispositions to certain behaviors. For example, um, a herding dog, a border collie, would have a genetic disposition to herd. And that's why you hear people saying things like, oh, the border collie is aggressive because it's nipping at young children's heels. That's not really the dog being aggressive. The dog is doing what comes naturally to them. A German Shepherd or a Rottweiler being, being protective of their family, being um, protective of, of their territory. Yeah, that might come across as a negative behaviour and aggression, but that's what their breed was designed to do. So there is some, some genetic elements to that. There's other, other situations like early socialisation. So a lot of the time when dogs have been rescued and we've got no idea what happened in the early stages, or if people just don't know, they've not been educated or found out how to do it properly, or indeed through a pandemic, which we saw a lot of just after the COVID lockdowns opened up. A lack of exposure to various stimuli during that puppyhood developmental stages can result in fear, and fear can again result in aggression. So the thing is there is once that situation has happened, once that early socialization has passed, you don't just give up, you can actually socialize older dogs as well. So don't give up hope if you think that's got something to do with it. Then of course you've got trauma. Trauma is a big thing and it doesn't just, uh, doesn't just work on the situation when it comes to dogs. Same with people. You might know somebody who's incredibly patient, incredibly kind and a traumatic event can drastically change their position in life, change their the way that they are as a person or as a dog, the way they see situations, and that can create that aggressive response or that negative response, and that's because of their past experiences. And then one of the big ones which gets missed out an awful lot is health issues. Pain, discomfort, itchiness, anything from arthritis, dental problems, to anything else can lead to aggression, just as it can with humans, it can in dogs. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of people don't realize that aggression has a, a huge psychological part to it as well. Um, aggression can be a learned behavior because dogs can learn that aggressive behavior yields the outcomes that they want. So it's kind of like operant conditioning, right? So uh, imagine if a dog growls at a stranger and then the stranger moves away. The dog learns that growling is an effective way to protect itself uh, and, and it comes up with, with what it wants to be. Usually that happens. The, the worst thing that a lot of people do is that, oh, when 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 your dog is growling, they, they, they start to reprimand their dog. They start to scold their dog. That also makes it a lot worse because you are essentially telling your dog that I don't want you to ever growl. Instead, the dog learns that, okay, fine, I won't growl. So instead of growling, they start to just snap. They just start to snap and then they still get scolded for it. And then they go to the next thing, which is like a bite. And then it, it just gets worse and worse. And then people say, oh, my dog's just way too aggressive. But you, you don't realize that you are reinforcing the wrong thing with your dog. So th this, is, this is, how would I put it? Okay, a, a form of social learning as well. So dogs can also learn aggressive behaviors by observing other dogs or humans. Don't forget that. Like if you are a generally aggressive person and a dog and you your dog learns from you as well. They 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 see that you are using aggression to achieve a goal. Your dog can learn to imitate that behavior because because that's what dogs do. They they learn from us. And if you do not learn to be calm around your dog, your dog will always be nervous if you do not learn to not show aggressive sides to, to you your dog will learn to be aggressive as well there is also a response to threats that, that dogs do or perceived threats at least so there, there's things like um self-protection because a dog may try to use aggression as a defensive mechanism if they feel threatened it's a very natural response it's rooted in their instinct to protect themselves 
it's, it's same for us. Like if, if you get cornered, you would of course want to to try your best to, to protect yourself. The the perceived threat could be anything. Like it could be a, uh, another animal. It could be a person. It could even be an object that we do not deem it to be a threat. But your dog doesn't know that un unless you've done proper conditioning and and proper training exercises to to show your dog that it's not a threat. That's why there are a lot of dogs out there who are scared of of the vacuum cleaner, for example, because it's something that just came out of nowhere. It made a lot of noise, and and it's moving around weirdly. Your dog might growl or snap at, at at the at the vacuum cleaner if you have not done the proper conditioning exercises with your dog. There is also things like territorial defense. So, like like I spoke a little bit about it earlier, a dog perceives. An intruder coming into his territory it's an instinctual behavior that dogs will do to protect their home you have to teach your dog that i am in charge of this i'm protecting you do not worry about this the person i'm letting into the house is a friend it's it's not a it's not a danger but other than that if if somebody else would try to come into my house and i do not answer the door my girls would keep barking and if you really try to no one has ever tried <laughs> but if you really try to break into my house i'm pretty sure you're going to get bitten if i'm not there to answer the door which is which is fine for me there is also a resource guarding a very common one resource guarding is where dogs perceive that this is a particular valuable resource it could be food could be toys it could be um, even their beds, like like somewhere they like to rest a lot. Once again, it's also very instinctual behavior. They dogs need to protect their resources to survive. So if another dog or another person comes too close to his food bowl while eating, the dog might growl or snap. It's up to you to teach your dog that you don't have to worry. The food will always be there. I won't let another dog or person come and take the food away from you. There's of course um what. I think uh, Frazier can help me on a little bit here, is the protection of loved ones. So dogs mm. often show aggression to protect their owners or other members um, in the family. It, that could be like another pet as well. I've had a client whose dog was very protective of their cat, which was really cute to see, but then it did progressively get more and more aggressive from, from what I see. Because we, their loved ones are considered a value as well. They, they might like fully understand that, you know, food comes from from this person like shelter comes from this person water comes from this person so that's why they they see this see this person as as a huge valuable resource yeah one of the other thing that happens there is uh dogs that have the the highest value of person their leader if that leader shows a lot of attention and love to another animal or individual dog can become protective of that person as well. A great example of that is a child. You know, like, uh, for example, my daughter Freya, she doesn't exactly, well, now she does, but when she was younger, she didn't exactly give a whole lot of value towards the dogs. She was an infant. She wasn't giving them anything, but ethos for sure was uh, was showing protectiveness of her. And that, that comes as part of the perceived threat towards the family. Um, and it is important to understand that that's not something that you should stereotype. So you don't stereotype the breed, even though yes, there are genetic components to that behavior. You don't want to be stereotyping the breed um, because every dog is different and every situation is different with unique experiences and triggers. Um, and again, if your dog ever does show any sort of outlying aggressive behavior, you've got to check with your with your vet, get a proper veterinary checkup to rule out any medical conditions. Um, as if you don't catch it, it doesn't matter what you do. If that medical cause starts to worsen, so will the aggression because that discomfort, that pain will continue to grow. So. Jay, you went through the types of aggressions really well there. You went through the fear aggression, territorial aggression, protective aggression, and resource guarding quite in depth. But um, what we need to actually look at here is the common signs of aggression. A lot of people get this a little bit up, uh, mixed up. They, they think of the obvious ones, 
um, growling, barking, lunging, snapping, biting. Yes, that is very common signs of aggression. But there's a lot more subtle things that you need to be looking for before any of this happens. But to reiterate what Jay said earlier, if your dog is growling, if your dog is barking, even if your dog starts lunging or snapping, or even if your dog bites someone or another dog, you do not scold your dog because as Jay has just said, that is a very high likelihood that it's coming from fear or protectiveness. And if you're actually scolding your dog for being scared, for being anxious, that's just going to make things far worse because then you as a guardian, as a protector, you're not doing your job and the dog feels that they're going to have to do more and, and looking after themselves, keeping themselves safe, which can lead to more aggression. But look for the early recognition signs of aggression. Body cues, stiff postures, raised hackles, intense staring. You see the, the whites of their eyes, that whale eyeing, or they're gazing directly at something. They're kind of like, mm. it's like giving the stink eye. You may see that by humans in bars sometimes, in public spaces. I'm sure we've all had a friend that got a little bit leery. It's a similar sort of idea, that stiff body posture, that, that sort of, Ur. You see it in people, dogs do a similar thing with that stiff body posture, the staring. And you must understand the context. Nobody knows your dog better than you, okay? There's a lot of people out there that might be able to read your dog better, that might be able to advise you on what is going on with your dog, but you spend the most time with your dog. And if you educate yourself or get educated on how to understand which specific triggers develop that actual reactivity from your dog, you can do a lot more. And by understanding the context of that and when the aggression occurs, where the aggression occurs, what is the location? What's going on? Who's around? Are there strangers approaching? Is there family members around? Is it during feeding? Is it during when there's a certain object around or a certain treat? Or What's going on around you? What's happened before? Dogs are like people. If they get very stressed, they don't all of a sudden just chill out. In fact, one thing that I would like to actually talk about a little bit is something I've spoken about before. And this is the stress bucket, the stress, the analogy of that stress bucket where, yeah, you might have your bucket here and the stress level gets to here when you wake up because everybody's got a little bit of stress. And then you might take your dog for a quick morning walk and your dog is excited. Oh, well, positive stress, but it's still stress. Then your dog gets home and gets breakfast. Oh, that's exciting as well. Then you may have a little bit of time to chill out, so that will come down a little bit. But then you have a guest come into the house. Your dog either gets anxious or excited. So that goes up again. And then you go out for your afternoon walk. You go out there, you get excited. And then a massive dump truck roars past right beside him and his stress goes up here. Well, now there's not much left. So it might be the case of just one dog passing and giving your dog the side eye. Your dog's stress level goes over the top. Bang. You've just seen your dog react. So it's not always as simple as Oh, my dog reacted to that golden retriever. Therefore, my dog is triggered by golden retrievers. What was happening around at that point, both environmentally and throughout the day? Because that stress level, the stress hormone buildup in your dog does impact that context of when your dog may actually react. And this is why... You speak to anybody worth their salt, the moment they are asked by somebody what to do, they're going to say, OK, let's take a look at how we can lower your dog's general stress level. What's happening throughout the day where you could help your dog become a little bit more relaxed so that, that stress level is lower. Those stress hormones 
are not built up as high and they're generally lower. So there's more to play with and your dog doesn't get as reactive as quickly. And that also helps a lot to develop an effective management plan because you will know what triggers your dog, what stresses your dog out, just by looking at all of that component. Now, I kind of went off on a wee bit of a tangent there talking about that, but that's okay. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to be looking at actually how to handle aggression. So with that, I'll stop talking for a little while and let Jay go on to <laughs> identify the triggers and the like. Yeah, okay. So when when you are able to identify the triggers like, like Bridger has, has talked about, it's very important that if it does happen or when it happens that you are very calm and you have confidence in you. So dogs are very highly attuned to our emotions and they can pick up on things like anxiety, fear, and stress. They don't necessarily understand that we are stressed because our dog is reactive and we are worried about our dog reacting to that person or to that other dog. When faced with situations like this, it's very crucial for you to maintain calm and composed. Because if you can react to a situation with calmness and uh, composure, your dogs look at you and realize that I'm actually a lot more secure. I do not need to feel that anxious. How to achieve it is very different from everybody. It's very different for everybody. I normally, when I was still doing a lot of all this um, counter conditioning work with Blue and Ori, I had to take a deep breath. I do not make any sudden movements. I don't suddenly yank on the leash or things like that. I have to constantly remind myself to be very relaxed. Like, I'm in charge of the situation. I do not need to worry. I'm in control. I am setting a very good example for my dogs. If your dog reacts and you panic and you you, you lose your mind, you're, you're trying to fight for control of the leash or, or whatever it is, your dog realizes that you are just getting more and more stressed. You are not in control of the situation and then they feel like they have to settle it themselves. So I have a very... I use a very confident voice when I talk to my, my girls in, in situations like that. I go like, Blue, Ori, leave it, and then settle it that way. Of course, if if voice, if just vocal uh, cues are not enough, that also means that you have not trained them to use that particular cue in such a high-stress situation. So you have to work towards there. Next thing is, of course, positive reinforcement. The best thing that you can do, for example, if your dog is reactive to other dogs, you reward them for being calm in the presence of other dogs. If your dog cannot be calm in the presence of another dog, you create more distance. So you are trying it from 20 meters away. Your dog still gets super high fix hyper fixated on the other dog. Um, they, they are not accept uh, accepting treats and things like that. You move further away. You go to 30 meters and then you try it again. If it still doesn't work, go to 40 meters. I have clients who start from over 100 meters from, from another dog because their dog is that reactive to another dog. Also, the timing of your reward is very important. The reward should be given immediately after the desired behavior so you can create a clear association between that behavior and the reward. If you wait too long, you your dog might think that they're being re uh, rewarded for something else. So if you miss that timing, don't worry about it. Try again another time. You can still, still always give your dog some love. Um, that's something that a lot of people have to get the hang on, the hang off because timing is very important. The next thing is, please avoid punishment. Punishment increases anxiety and it, and it can increase the level of aggression that your dog has. It, it makes the problem worse rather than try to solve it. If you if you are punishing a dog who is acting aggressive out of fear, you are adding more fear to your dog. Eventually, your dog learns to distrust you and showcase even more aggressive behavior. So, or worse, your dog will simply learn to fear you, which is not something you want, because then your dog will eventually turn on you as well, because they they're so scared of of everything around. They feel like, oh, you know what, my handler, my owner is not not even um, reinforcing me, they're, they're not teaching me the right things, that's the worst outcome of all. So instead of punishing, always focus on redirecting your dog's behavior to encourage the right behavior. 
it's it's like the same thing for kids. You have to teach your kid to do the right thing instead of just scolding them for doing the wrong thing all the time. I think Frazier would <laughs> would agree with me on that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with kids. Um, I know it's different for everybody, but if if kids were as easy to deal with as dogs, I would be a I would be a very popular person if I was if I was able to do with kids what we can do with dogs. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's a, all of this is really really important. But what we've looked at so far is how to handle the aggression from a helicopter view. You know, so a lot of people are thinking to themselves right now, all right, so that's how to deal with it in general. What do we actually do in the moment? Like, what happens when we've got to do it? Well, first, you've got to understand when to intervene. Okay. Now, again, this might sound like we're kind of dodging the actual thing, but I promise we are going to talk about handling aggression in the moment. So stay with us here. But one of the biggest things is to have early intervention. So observe your dog's body language, as I was saying earlier. Look for those early signs of discomfort or agitation. Look for really minor things like licking of the lips or constantly diverting their gaze. Or if something potentially stressful is coming up, they may just go around and sniff around down at the bottom. We actually do have a, an article that I wrote a long time ago um, on calming signals. And if you want to, you can have a look at that one on our website. Uh, for those of you watching live, we'll get the, the link to that posted into the comment section as soon as we can. But as soon as you see that your dog is uncomfortable, that is when you intervene. You don't wait until your dog starts to get upset and starts to get growly and lunging and things like that. If you're able to catch it beforehand, do so. Now, that's not always possible. I get that. I get that it's not always easy. In fact, both Jay and I have both dealt with reactivity in our own dogs, let alone the, the countless number of dogs that we've worked with, um, with clients. Having that in your own household is very different from going in and training somebody else's dog. So we do appreciate that. Um, but that is very, very important. And if you do miss it, that first sign of aggression, that's when you intervene. You don't wait for uh, an escalation. You want to prevent that escalation before it happens. So the next thing would be Sorry. redirection techniques. So like Jay, Jay did comment on that earlier on. You've got to proof your cues, proof your commands so that you can redirect your dog's attention from that potential trigger and uh, provide an alternative behavior for your dog to focus on. Before people have got that, those uh, commands and cues to that level, and for you guys watching this live or watching the playbacks, there's an episode of our podcast that we did a while ago um, called Proofing your dog's behavior. It's episode 11, which came out um, in June uh, last year. So you can have a look at that one, and that one talks about how to bring that to reality, from being able to do a simple command in the house to bring it into a stressful situation. Um, providing alternative behaviors for your dogs before you've done that can consist of something as simple as find it. You see people doing this a lot, dropping a treat saying find it, and their dog's got to go and find it, or even just sticking something in top, front of their dog's face to try and redirect them. Understand that when you're doing things like that, that's not actually educating your dog not to react. That's a preventative measure, and that's all. So just doing that alone, it's just more of management. So you, you still need to work on the core issue, the behavioral issue that your dog has that is resulting in this aggression. After redirecting our dog, I mean, I did it so much with Blue and Ori because they were just going at each other and they were sending each other to the vet so often that I think that Blue thinks her name is Leave It <laughs> at some point <laughs> because that's what I did. I worked on Leave It so much that so that if if I catch them 
just staring at each other for for a little bit too long. I know that something's gonna happen. I just try. And, I call their names. I just break that that focus, and then I ask them to leave it, and then they just redirect towards their their own things. Of course, I no one nobody's perfect, right? So I did not manage to catch every single time. I do my best to 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 be on top of things, but then there are always situations whereby whereby you might have missed this or missed that or and it's not because um it's never because your dog is randomly aggressive no that's not a thing your your dogs are never just aggressive for no reason there's always a reason you might have just missed it if that situation comes to it what i do is i have to remove your dog or dogs from that situation very calmly and that's the most difficult thing to do if your dogs are going at each other or your dog is going at it with another dog. Trying to break them apart was honestly one of the toughest things I've ever done, even though it only lasted like a couple of seconds. And, and there's so much stress involved. There's so much uh, worries involved as well. I did muzzle train both of my girls. So when I did like proper reintroductions to it, each other, I, I had to do it safely. You can use muzzles, you can use a barrier, um, those baby gates work great. You can use leashes. All of these things are just to create more distance or create more safety. And it prevents things from escalating too far beyond control and you need to, you know, seek medical help and things like that. It is very important for everyone listening that's dealing with aggression, whether now or in the future, you never let your dogs fight it out and hope that the, the issue solves itself. That is not something you do because it is. it only reinforces that you are not capable of handling the situation yourself. And I know it gets very frustrating, like, oh, I've, I've done this training exercise for a month, for two months, three months, however long you've done it, and I see no improvement. Sometimes improvements progress is not so obvious sometimes it it your dog might feel a lot better but then they don't show it yet you just have to keep working at it and then also realize that every single time your dog reacts in an aggressive behavior that actually throws your your training back quite a bit so you could have done it for three months straight but during that three months your dog keeps um having aggressive reactions towards other dogs that means you need to be you need to adjust the times that you walk your dogs. So don't walk them at bloody 6.30 or 7 p.m. when everybody decides to walk their dogs at the same time. You, I started walking the girls at midnight. <laughs> I had to because, because of, of all the aggression that and all the reactivity that there was. It kept me a lot more sane as well. It, it honestly felt a lot better when I started walking there in the middle of the night because I felt like, you know what? I don't really have to worry about people or dogs or things like that. I enjoyed the walks a lot more, even though I, I got, of course, I was more tired. I had less sleep. But if you enjoy the walk, your dogs enjoy the walk. But if you're about to leave the house and you're going like, ah, here we go, and things like that, your dog picks up on that. And then they're like, why is mom or dad stressed? They don't understand that they're, you're stressed because... Your, you know your dog's going to react to another dog. They just think that, oh, mom or dad is stressed. I'm going to look for the cause of the stress. And then they will focus in on the first thing that they see. And if that's another dog, they think that, oh, mom or dad is stressed because of that dog. So I'm going to start barking my head off at that dog until that dog leaves. And then mom or dad is not stressed anymore. And that's usually the case. <laughs> that's what happens. So keep calm, keep composed, and make sure that you are on top of things. And then your dog will feel a lot more comfortable with you. Now, one of the big things that Jay did do, which was a very, very important aspect, is he sought professional help. Yep. Now, <clears throat> this was many years ago, by the way, but Jay reached out to me, although I think he reached out to others before me, but he eventually reached out to me. Um, and what we ended up doing was we created a tailored behaviour modification plan for his situation, because every situation is slightly different. And there's certain things that just need to be changed completely. You know, like where the dog might be sleeping, what you're doing during the day. Sometimes even your schedule, as Jay says, needs to change. And uh, that is something that's very, very important. And when you try to do it just yourself, it can be quite tough. And I'm not suggesting that everybody's going to do what Jay did which was effectively go deep down the rabbit hole to the point where he now does 
the professional help for others, um, very well, I might add. Um, but it still helps an awful lot to find somebody that can help you in that moment because trying to deal with this yourself is an absolute stress ball. It really is. I mean, when I was dealing with it all those years ago with Athos, which is now 10 years ago, um, I did go through a few different trainers, but I still had to go to a professional veterinary behaviorist in the UK um, who had basically told me to study um, as well as get the help from them so that I could rehabilitate. Now, now in Singapore, as well as the rest of the world, there's a lot more actual behavior consultants and good trainers that can actually provide you with this help. And that's really, really important. Um, I've said it time and time again, so I'll not repeat myself again, but you've got to make sure that you find the right person, not just for you and not just for your dog, but the people that are doing it right. The people that are actually updating their skills, the people that are continuously upgrading themselves. You would never want a medical professional working on yourself that hasn't continued their studies, that hasn't kept themselves up to date with modern medical science. And you wouldn't want the same thing happening to somebody trying to help your dog's behavior, particularly when it comes to aggression, because then you're talking about the safety of people around your dog, dogs around your dogs, and your dog themselves. Because aggression doesn't always go one way. If a small dog is aggressive towards a huge dog and that huge dog reacts with one snap, that could be it. You don't know. Yep. So that's a very, very important aspect to, uh, to look at. Now, we dig, dig deep into the actual meat and potatoes of what most people actually want to hear. What do you do in the moment? So there's aggression happening. How can you deal with that? Well, the first thing you've got to think about is safety, your safety, your dog's safety. Now, Jay's already highlighted this, so I'll just very briefly go over this. We talk about the four C's. Calm. You must stay calm. Easier than it sounds, but a good leader will always stay calm. If your boss at work was not calm, you lose respect for them, you don't really want to listen to them in the event of an emergency. So you've got calm, clear. Whatever you are trying to communicate to your dog must be clear, which means your dog must know what you are saying. If you have been working on redirection by using leave it, do not shout, stop, go away, get it back here. Your dog has no idea what you're talking about. You must be clear. So you've got calm, clear, confident. You must be or at least act confident. Better to be <laughs> confident. Confidence is a huge aspect when it comes to this because your dogs want to know that you are able to keep them safe. And nine times out of 10, that's enough. If your dog is fully confident in you, the chances of them reacting are far lower. Calm, clear, confident, consistent. Your behavior must be consistent with your dogs. Your voice must be in a calm, firm manner. Some people don't like it. They think, oh no, but I want to baby my dog. The reason we don't do that is because of the practicalities of life. If you do all of your training by saying, come on, Fluffy, come back here, and then all of a sudden there's an aggression situation, your brain's not going to allow you to go, come on, Fluffy, come back here. You're going to start screaming. So if you start by training in a firm, calm voice, you'll be able to do that in a real life situation, which is why when Jay was saying about how he trains his girls, that's because he needs to use that in potentially real life situations. Biggest thing as well, when you're handling aggression in the moment, if possible, remove your dog from the triggering environment which is causing the aggression. Now, we are not talking about necessarily a dog fight, but if your dog is lunging, barking, snarling, get them out of that situation. Use your leash 
to gently but firmly guide them away. If you have started work, you will be doing things like leash pressure guidance. You will be doing things like, like follow me exercises, shuttle exercises, where it's going to make it easier. You will know how to handle the leash properly. We even did a video earlier on um, this month, I think, where even just holding the leash properly makes a difference because it means that you have got a better grip. You've got, you're able to actually guide better. So removing your dog from that situation is paramount. Yep. So after you remove your dog from that situation, what do you do? You have to create a safe distance. And that distance is completely dependent on your dog. What what distance away from the trigger does your dog feel safe enough to stop reacting? So like I said earlier, every dog is different. Some could be 20 meters, some could be 100, some could be more than that. When you figure out that distance is when you can start doing counter conditioning exercises. So I use a lot of uh, barriers, gates. Um, you can create your dog if you need to, to separate your dog from, from the, another trigger or the other dog. We, we teach our dog a lot of important cues that people think is just, oh, my dog does it perfectly at home. But that's the problem. It's just at home. So they sit down, come, leave it. Um, bit is actually a very big one that a lot of people tend to miss, like teaching your dog to go to bed when they're stressed out. So right now, if my girls were to get into any form of um, issues with each other, or even if they're playing and one of them is playing a little bit too rough, the other one will just retreat to their bed. And you teach your dogs to respect the safe space of their bed. So if they're on their beds, there's no playing going on. Nobody disturbs them on their beds. Not even me. If Blue and Ori goes to their bed, I don't go up to them and then give them like gentle pats and things like that. They're, they're on their bed themselves. I never recall them off their beds either because I want them to know that this is your space. This is where you go to to relax and de-stress. I know that you're, you're not feeling too, too great or you're tired or whatever. This is for you. Of course, redirecting your dog requires high value, right? So whether the high value comes from a treat, a toy, or even you yourself, uh, we've, we've talked about this in previous episodes whereby you need to increase your value as a person to your dog, right? So I have very high value treats for Ori. I have very high value toys for Blue because that's what I perceive as their highest form of reward. So for, for Blue, it's always play. For Ori, it's always food. You have to figure out what your dogs want and you use that to reinforce it. I have a couple of toys that I have not opened. They're all sitting on the top shelf. They they are used for certain situations where, where I feel like I really need something to reinforce the highest form of value for blue. Same for food. I have... I always have bacon. <laughs> That's the thing. I always have a, a couple of bacon strips in the fridge and I use that to re reward Ori if she's doing something that I really want her to, to continue doing. I want to reinforce that behavior. You have to figure out what form of value your dogs want and what's the best way to, to reinforce all these desired behaviors. Absolutely. Now, one of the big ones that we're going to talk about now, and this is something that we don't necessarily like to talk about because a lot of people will take it out of context. But we will, because this is the topic. What do you do if your dog is in a situation where they are in a dog fight or actively attacking someone or mid-bite? This is where it becomes very, very challenging. Okay? So... Ensure the safety of everyone involved, and that includes your dog. However, you've got to be able to control things. So do not physically interact with your hands because you've got to avoid injury. You go in there with your hands, you're going to get ripped apart. The dogs aren't going to differentiate between your hands and the other dog. And the moment your dog notices that your hands are in the mix, they may get distracted and end up getting hurt as well. So if you are trained to do this, and I mean if you are trained, you will see some people stepping through with their legs. I do not want the general public doing that. If you know how to do that, you've been shown how to do that. Generally, the only people that have been shown how to do that are people that have worked with, uh, with attack dogs and security dogs and things like that. I do not advise anybody to copy that. The reason I'm mentioning this 
is because you see it all the time on YouTube. People, what to do when you're separating dog fights? Don't do that, guys. I don't want you doing it. You're going to get hurt. Okay. You can use a blanket. Now, the blanket's not to throw over the dogs. Okay. It's to create a barrier between them. So you will twist it up, put the blanket between them, and drag it. That will generally pull them back. And from there, you can scoop your dog away, the other person scoops their dog away, okay? You can do the same with leashes. Not as effective, but it does work. You can do the same with a walking stick or a big stick if you find one when you're out. This is not to do anything cruel to the dogs. I will make that very clear. What you do is you will slide that stick on the ground between the dogs and then lift it up like a lever so that it actually angles between them. This is all creating a physical barrier between the dogs so that they can then be redirected, okay? If your dog is locked on, for a start, you hear people saying, oh yeah, this breed of dog is a jaw that can lock. No, they don't. Dogs don't, dogs don't do that. They're not reptiles. They don't have that kind of capacity. They just have very strong jaws. They have very strong bites. Um, it's not something that you need to worry about. They're not locked on. But there's a few different things that you can do. Um, if your dog is locked on and you are able and confident enough, you can go just under the jaw and slightly forward and gently, gently put pressure so that the teeth will open ever so slightly. Then, as counterintuitive as this sounds, you move them forward before bringing them back. You look at the shape of a dog's jaws, the teeth are all pointing back because that's what's useful for hunting. Something's trying to run away and you get a grip of it, then pulling away is only gonna dig that in deeper, which leads to the second part. You do not pull the dog directly backwards. You will always move them to the side so you don't do as much damage. If a dog, has locked onto your arm, your hand, your leg, what you've got to do is push in and then remove it out. Now, for any of you that have actually ever met Jay or I in person, you can ask to see some of the scars. Jay unfortunately had an incident where somebody pulled the dog off of him very early on and um, before Jay did this for a living. And you can see the scarring is pretty bad. I've had a dog clamp down on me, which could have been pretty bad, and I was lucky enough that I knew at that point to push in and pull out. The only reason I knew that is simply from working on farms and farmers and all that kind of thing. So it just is a different in, difference in experience, which can show you the difference. Um, I would strongly recommend not putting yourself into any situation where you need any of that um, knowledge, but it's better to have it and not use it than not to have it and something go wrong. Yep. Again, if that aggression persists and you've tried the things, immediately veterinary visit to make sure that there's no injury or aggression uh, based uh, health issues, sorry, health issues that can create that aggression. Um, with that point, after any aggression incident where there is a bite, whether it be a dog fight, whether it be a dog biting another human, Yes, of course, the human goes to the doctor, but the dog goes to the vet, okay? You must see if anything has happened to that dog, if the dog is injured, okay? And make sure you document everything. Remember what was going on before the incident. Take pictures. I know it sounds ridiculous, but don't take pictures while it's happening. Deal with it. But if you've got CCTV, if it was in your house, that's useful to keep. Make sure that you know exactly what's going on for two reasons. Number one, if your dog has attacked another dog or has attacked a person, there's a high chance there will be a police report. You must have as much information as possible so that you can fight your case to keep your dog alive. It's also really important for point two, so you can talk to your behavioral consultant with all of the information that they need to help. So make sure that even when things that matter have happened, you are ensuring that you are documenting all of this.
okay? Then we move into long-term strategies. So ongoing training and environmental management, we've spoken about that. We've uh, spoken about providing mental and physical stimulation to reduce frustration and anxiety. We've talked about engaging your dogs in puzzles and training and in regular exercise. We've done this in other podcasts. We've done this in articles and videos. So I'll not go too deep into that. But Jay, I'll leave you to talk about the actual long-term strategies to help the dogs. Perfect thing. So the number one thing that everybody has to do is, of course, gradual socialization. We we talk about socialization a lot and people always think that it's just that, so, oh, I, I want my dogs to have a good time. Good. That's a very good thing. But then gradually exposing your dogs to all of these new experiences of all of these new people, uh, all of these new animals, you have to do it in a very slow rate at a very slow pace because you don't want to overwhelm your dog at one go. It's You have to be able to control the environment and make sure that everything is done positively. You start with very low stress environments. You don't, for example, if I'm about to bring in another dog to whether it's to foster or I, I adopt another dog, I bought another dog, whatever it is, I'm not going to just bring it in immediately, right? I have to start having um, spaces allocated for, for certain things. Like I would only assign this room if uh, the living room for if my dogs were to want to play with each other. And then I would have this corner of, of the bedroom for, for the new dog and you slowly expose them through barriers, through fences, whatever it is. And everything has to be done very positively. I have to repeat that a lot of times because if anything goes wrong, your dog realizes that, oh, um, this new person in the home or this new dog in the in in the home has caused me stress. So I'm not too happy about it. And then they start to see have a negative outlook on this. It's the same, <clears throat> it's the same for people as well. If if you have another roommate or if you have another partner coming to stay with you, you have to do it in the right way. You don't want any sort of friction between the relationship of, of your dog and this new thing, this person, animal experience, whatever. When I say start with low stress environments, of course, um, Blue and Ori were first introduced to each other in on leash inside a dog run, an empty dog run with each other. They could go up to each other, they could say hi to each other and then I'd redirect them away. And then they just did that a few times. And then when I saw that they were comfortable enough with each other, took off their leashes, and then I allowed them to, to play with each other for a bit. But even then, I would still step in to stop the play after some time. I want them to... Because Blue has this has this issue, right? She just goes 100%. She just wants to keep playing nonstop. And I could see that Oreo is getting a bit uncomfortable, getting a bit stressed. So I, I separated them for a bit, and then I let them try again later on. So you just keep trying this over and over again until they're very comfortable with each other. Next is your routine. Your dog needs this sense of security. Your dog needs to know when it is feeding time, when it is time for walking, when when you're going to start doing training. This implemented schedule or routine throughout their daily lives provides them with a lot of security. They know like, okay, I know what to expect is coming next. So I, I know that um, mom or dad is going to feed me now. They're going to walk me now. They're going to train me now. If you do not have a consistent routine, your dog doesn't know what's coming next. Things like food, for example, they'll be like, oh, is food going to come next? If if my next meal is not going to come, I have to really guard this meal that I'm having right now. So you 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 create unnecessary stress. So make sure you have a very consistent routine, something that works for both you and your dogs as well. So one thing that's not spoken about very often with regards to this, is the self-care for dog owners. This is a very underrated topic. And a lot of people just sort of skip it out. But handling an aggressive dog or handling a dog with aggressive behaviours is incredibly stressful. It, it, it can increase your anxiety levels massively. So seek support from communities like ours that we've got on Facebook or like others, and from professionals. And I'm not just talking about dog professionals. There is no shame in joining support groups, talking to other dog owners who have insights and can give you emotional support, and if necessary, going to therapy. It is an incredibly underrated thing, and I really, really cannot stress enough 
how important it is for you to look after yourself. Because if you don't, your dog will basically mirror your anxieties, mirror your stress levels, mirror your frustration and anger at the situation. And they won't understand why you're feeling that way, but they will respond to it. So self-care is really, really something that needs to be looked at. The so, next thing, do I go on? Yeah, so yeah, self-care is so important. Like, I, I remember a, a while back, uh, one of my clients put their dog down and then I was completely gone. I, I just immediately messaged Fraser and said, you know what, I, I can't work for the rest of the week because that mentally got me really badly. And then, I mean, of course we understand each other. So we know that, um, okay, I, I need this break or or I, I need some time off so so that I can just compose myself. So don't ever doubt your, your if, if you need support and things like that, always just seek for it, always look for it. It's very important that you are in a good place so that you can do, so that you can help your dog. And check in with us or with your, your trainer or with your consultant, whoever it is, you have to always regularly check in with them because they need to know what, progress you're making and they could just make some slight changes here and there through to, to the training plan excuse me if your behavioral consultant if your dog trainer doesn't know where you're at in regards to your training with your dog right now they can't prepare things for you so uh, a, a big issue for for us is that we always ask our clients to keep us updated on how training is going send us videos of, of when you are doing training or when you're walking your dog, things like that. Because if, knock on wood, if your dog were to, to get into a bite incident, we have the necessary evidence to support that, you know what, um, this dog's owner is really making an effort to better, better um, his or her dog's current situation. So things, people from uh, NParks or AVS, they, they usually get contacted if if dog bites happen, if, if a certain situation arises from an incident with a dog and then they will look for us because we're the ones training that dog training that family and then we can tell them you know what um they are really on point with the training they're doing a lot of the training i don't think it's fair to to penalize them blah 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 stuff like that never hesitate to ask for help if you need it always keep them updated these are two very important parts that that everyone should should take away from this Absolutely. So on that note, just because Jay mentioned that, the thing we are talking about right now, the whole thing of this podcast, to summarize the key points here, we're talking about understanding aggression, identifying the triggers, using positive reinforcement to sort it out, because I'll tell you right now, using punishment does not work. You only think it works because it works when you are present. If the fear, if the person that's creating the fear, stopping the dog from doing it, isn't around, that will not work. The dog will react. Or you'll put the dog into complete emotional shutdown, and in which case, that's not why you wanted a dog in the first place, is to have a dog that's too scared to even enjoy a walk. It doesn't do what you want it to do. And managing behaviour. Early intervention is paramount in seeking professional help and, dare I say it, listening to that professional help is incredibly important. The client that Jay is talking about, we are obviously not going to name names. That's not of course. the type of people we are. But effectively what happened was that client had had an initial what consultation. Wish, what would you wish for? Sorry, not sure what happened there. That client would have had an initial consultation and that client then had made up their mind that it was too much effort, too much work. They were too scared and they went and did something rash. That's not what we would advise anybody to do. If you've not put in the effort, if you've not put in the work, you know, you can't make a judgment call like that it's just not fair on the dog or or the family me members or anybody involved um so before 
we wrap up, I do want to answer the questions that were posted in the comments. So Jay, have you seen any of these questions that you would like to answer? Uh, you go ahead, I'll, I'll read through it while you answer the first one. Okay, well, I'm gonna just pick out, okay. So, oh, during our walks, my dog gets reactive to other passing dogs. She would lunge and growl at the other dogs. I would then pull her back until the other dog moves a distance away. Look, oh, you are doing the exact correct thing. Um, the only thing that I would say is, as we've spoken about there, is try to learn what the, the really small signals are before it happens are, so that you're able to react quicker. But more importantly, start to work on that desensitization, on that counter conditioning, on that confidence building. Well, we can figure out why the dog gets reactive to passing dogs. If you're able to figure out that exact trigger, it's far easier to start working on getting rid of it. But as far as management goes, what would be useful for you is to be able to have more control over your dog. I'm not sure what sort of tools you're using, but it would be really beneficial to have that little bit of additional control. So if you get a well-fitted harness, very important point there, the harness must be well-fitted, which means it's like a dress shirt. You can only fit two fingers in there, and that's, that's how tight the harness should be, with a front clip and a back clip, so that when you need to redirect your dog, you're actually turning the whole body and not just yanking at your dog's neck because dogs are able to overcome that pain. And uh, that again, that's why your likes of your, your shock collars, your, your uh, choke collars, your prong collars, all that stuff, they've got limited effectiveness and they work until you've got to up the pain, up the discomfort. They work until you've got to up it again. They work until you've got to up it again, at which point, are you actually just abusing your dog? So you want to be able to move your whole dog's body so that you're able to redirect that a little bit easier. There are techniques that you can use to make that even easier as well. But I would strongly recommend if you're walking and your dog is reacting to passing dogs, definitely start to work on actually solving the problem. Now, as I say, please feel free to reach out to us I've not opened up your profile, but whether you're in Singapore, we can work with you physically, or if you're elsewhere overseas, we can work with you remotely online. It doesn't need to be us, of course, you don't need to come to us, but find somebody who is able to help you, and we would be more than happy to do so. Jay, next one. Is Jay still there? Yep, yep, there. Unfortunately, not by, not by history. Doesn't seem to have one. You don't seem to have another question? Yep. Oh, was it all just banter in the group? That's pretty good, though. I like the fact <laughs> that people yeah. sharing and people, uh, people sharing their experiences. That's really, really good. So even if you're listening to this on one of the podcast uh, um, servers, if you like, have a look at our Facebook page and see some of the comments because you've got people sharing things like, like Lisa. Lisa was watching this while she was in the vet in the back room with her dog because her dog was lunging at everybody. It's lonely having an aggressive doggo, she says. That is exactly right. Like this is the thing is that you, well, even when you take your dog to the vet, you, you're stuck in a back room because you can't be in the waiting room with everybody else. It's It's an incredibly stressful situation and I am glad to see that Lisa's actually got an appointment with us on Saturday so we'll be seeing her there and being able to help her out. Remember and, you're not alone. Exactly you're not alone and for any of you guys listening or watching this if you are having issues and you just want to reach out and share situations come and join our group and um, our Facebook group is the the Positive, the Positive Academy we'll share that link not just on the comments, but also we will share it in the podcast notes if you are listening elsewhere. Um, 
it's one of these things. Yeah, the Positive Training Hub, sorry, is our <laughs> Facebook group. I just had to double check that because uh, my memory when it comes to things like that is not awesome. There we go. Shared. So, yeah, please feel free to come in, share your stories, ask your questions. Let us help you. Okay. Um, and if we've got no other actual questions, you've got a lot of good banter and people chatting away, which is nice. But what we'll do here is we will call it a day. I think this has been a good one. A lot of people have been engaging. Um, it's something that a lot of people need help with, and we truly appreciate that. It's not an easy one. Just remember, guys, patience and consistency are the key factors in managing aggression. Reach out if you need advice. And with that said, I will thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next week. We will see you then. Okay, guys. Oh! <laughs>